All right, I'd like to welcome you all here today for today's seminar. This afternoon, we're going to have a talk uh, by Jonathan Nitsan, which is entitled No Way Out, Crime, Punishment, and the Capitalization of Power. Jonathan is a professor in the Department of Political Science and in the graduate program in social and political thought here at York University. And his publications, interviews, and courses are all available on his website, the Bickler and Nitsan Archives. And those interested will find the um, URL for the archives on the first page of your chart book. So without further ado, Jonathan, I guess you have an hour or so. OK, thank you very much. In May of last year, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that the state of California had to release between 30 and 40,000 inmates and prisoners. This is out of uh, an inmate population, about 140,000. So it represents about 25%. And this move was, in a way, imminent. Because for the previous two to uh, three decades, the state of California, along many other states in the US, was busy getting tough on crime. It enacted the so-called three strikes law, which dictates that three-time offenders, people who have been convicted of serious crimes for three times, get life in prison. It was also very hot on the war on drugs on, and other such campaigns. So not very surprisingly, the prisons uh, experienced a massive inflow. And soon enough, they were overflowing about twice their design capacity. The Supreme Court examining a long case dictated the situation was so bad to the point of being unconstitutional. Now, the United States is currently the world's largest penal colony. It has about 7 million people, even more, who are considered correctional. And that is comprised of about two, slightly over 2 million people in jail or in prison and another 5 million who are either on parole and on probation. This is the largest absolute number in the world. There's no other country with so many people in the correctional population. Uh, it's also the largest number in relative terms. It represents about 2.5% of the overall population, and it represents about 5% of the labor force in the United States. And it is also the highest number that the United States has ever experienced in its history. Now, this in a society that is often hailed as the liberal model for the world. The United States is ostensibly the world's largest free market. Uh, it's one of the most prosperous. And it is considered to be uh, the engine of capitalism, the engine of capital accumulation. So there is a certain uh, problem here, uh, at least intuitively, we would expect crime and massive punishment to be associated not with prosperity, but with poverty, with deprivation. We would expect it to be the experience of, say, third world countries rather than first world countries such as the United States. And I think that one reason for that expectation is the standardized bifurcation that we have become accustomed to in the social sciences. And that's the division between politics and economics. The division between the process of capital accumulation and the processes of employment growth and prosperity that happen in the economy and the political process, the state process, the social processes that we often associate with the other spheres of society. And the argument is that if there is prosperity in the economy, that prosperity reduces the necessity for crime and therefore reduces the incident of punishment. 
uh, and we have a more tolerant society and poorer society since Augustin uh, Kant, we think that uh, uh, violence is uh, more severe. So I think that this bifurcation has a lot to do with our intuitive expectation that we should not expect liberal societies to be the largest penal colonies. Now, if we take a different approach and we think of capital not as uh, something that belongs to the economy, but capital as power, and if we think about capitalism as a mode of power rather than a mode of production and consumption, excuse me. then uh, this puzzle suddenly disappears. If you think about the accumulation of capital as the capitalization of power, in order to accumulate, capitalists have to impose power on society. They have to create sabotage. They have to inflict damage. In fact, this is what gets capitalized, the power that is imposed on the underlying population. And of course, when you impose power, you elicit resistance. And if you want to accumulate more, if capitalists wish and they have no other choice, they have to wish to accumulate more. They have to inflict more damage, more sabotage, and therefore there's more resistance. And it is under those circumstances that you could possibly expect more crime and more punishment. So there might be actually nothing very puzzling about a society that is considered liberal on the one hand, that is considered a free market on the, other, on the one hand, but at the same time is um, besieged by massive crime and a lot of punishment. And what I'd like to do today is to examine this dialectical process, if you wish, in the case of the United States, and how we can possibly understand it from the perspective of capitals, capital as power, and specifically with relations, in relation to the limits on capital as power. And before I do that, I'd like to contextualize contextualize uh, this presentation in terms of the longer term research project that uh, Shimshon Bichler and myself have been engaged in over the last few years. So in the uh, Forum on Capital as Power, it's a conference that we held here in 2010, uh, we have argued that the current crisis, and by current we mean the crisis that began in fact in uh, the early 2000 rather than 2008. So if you look at the crisis from the perspective of capitalists, the crisis began with a massive bear market that started back then and continued with fluctuations. So it started not in 2008 but earlier. We argue that this crisis was not a regular crisis at all. It was a systemic crisis. It was not about employment, uh, so much. It was not about economic growth. It was not even about profitability. It was about capitalists being scared, uh, experiencing systemic fear, fearing for the very existence of their system. That was the claim we made in 2010. 2011, the next conference of the Forum on Capital is Power, we tried to examine the some of the objective conditions that made capitalists fearful for the system. So it's not just the animal spirits that somehow uh, went into reverse. Uh, it's not just the psychological quirk of the historical process. There are objective reasons why capitalists should be scared for the system. And we call that the asymptotes of power. We argue that uh, essentially capitalists are always engaged in inflicting damage on the rest of society in order to retain their rule. And we thought that perhaps at that point, capitalists are pushing towards the limits of that power, towards the asymptotes of, the, of, of that power. And we try to systematically unpack or deconstruct in uh, modern language, although not in exactly the same way as the deconstructors often like to deconstruct, but really systematically and deterministically to examine what are the limits on capital, capitalist power. And we basically broke the distributional process, which for us is a measurement of power, all the way from the aggregates of the national accounts down to the differential accumulation of 
the largest corporations in the United States, approximately 600 today, this is the top 1% of 1% of all corporations. And what we showed in, in that uh, work was that at every level of this deconstruction, you can see capitalists are pushing towards the limit. So there are objective reasons, we argued, for capitalists to fear that pushing those limits further might actually uh, tip the balance and create a backlash, a serious backlash against them that they might be unable to handle. And that's the basis for the systemic fear. Uh, it is not just a psychological condition. It's anchored in objective circumstances, and especially in class circumstances. So what I'd like to do today is to examine the darker underbelly of that process, to look at the process of resistance. And in the past, and perhaps even today, a lot of people uh, who are still thinking about capitalism as a mode of production and possibly also of consumption, analyze conflict and resistance from the viewpoint of production. So the emphasis is on labor unions, the emphasis is on strike, on mass mobilization, on political parties that represent, represent uh, different classes in production, etc. I think that uh, with the evolution of capitalism in the 20th century, especially in the second half of the 20th century, there emerged new ways of resistance and struggle. And one of those ways that I'd like to explore today has to do with crime and punishment. So what I will do now is begin with a couple of graphs that I presented in 2011. Uh, and uh, warm you up towards the discussion we are going to have. And there are, there are about nine charts, there, uh, and they might be scary to some of you, but I will explain what they are, and you, see that you will see that it's not uh, that menacing. All right. Maybe you cannot see the details from afar, but you all have a handout so you can follow my description in detail from close. OK, so figure one. Figure one shows the income share of the top 10% of the US population. So that tells you how much the top 10% of households in the United States receive of the overall income in society, including capital gains. Now, this 10% certainly represents or includes in it dominant capital. It includes in it the ruling class in general, but it includes much more than that. It includes what you may think of as the power belt that surrounds the ruling class, protects it, serves it, uh, is essential for the control that the ruling class imposes on the rest of society. So that's why we do not look at the top 1% or the top 1% of 1%, but the top 10%. Now, it's interesting to see that there is a very uh, stylized historical pattern, a U-shape, that is delimited by the two gray or uh, highlighted sections in the 1930s and in the, 19, in the 2000, since the period of the 2000s. Both of these represent historical extremes. They represent periods in which the top 10% accounted for or controlled more than 45% of all the income in society. And the argument was that these were the two periods in which capitalism in the 20th century experienced systemic crisis. And in both of these cases, dominant capital and um, the ruling class was pushing against its asymptotes. In the 1930s, pushing against these asymptotes eventually led to a systemic crisis of the 1930s. And it triggered a process that we call creorder, creating of new order, the creation of new order. And we know that what followed in the 1930s was the emergence of a new regime of the warfare welfare state. And you can see also the consequence of that creordering 
in the form of a massive decline in income inequality, which persisted more or less until the uh, early stages of neoliberalism in the 1980s, where the process started uh, to reverse again and income inequality started to rise. And the argument that we made back then is that in the 2000s, we are again in, this, in a similar territory that uh, the United States was, say, in the late 1920s. The ruling class is pushing against, again, its asymptotes of power. And perhaps there is some reversal in the offing. Perhaps there uh, is some uh, systemic crisis that uh, will be maybe deeper than the one that we experienced so far and will bring again, the creordering of that system or perhaps movement away from that system. Now, we then took another step, and we're moving to the next figure, figure two. And what you see in this figure is that we are taking the income distribution series from the previous chart, and that's in red. That's the thin line in red. And that's plotted against the right-hand scale. So that's the same thing from figure one. But we also superimposed on the same chart the correctional population. The correctional population comprises, again, to remind you, people in prison, in jail, on probation, and on parole, expressed as a share of the overall population. Now, it's quite remarkable that there is such a tight relationship between these two measures, between the measure of income distribution, especially since the 1930s, and the measure of penalty, if you like, the general measure of penalty, uh, the number of people actually under correction. Uh, we also see that this ratio, both of these ratios, have reached some sort of a, an apparent peak after the year 2000, uh, perhaps there is some reversal brewing. And perhaps the decision of the Supreme Court to release so many prisoners has to do with the fear of the ruling class that this situation cannot be sustained. You cannot lock so many people up without expecting to see some sort of a, a reversal in the form of a backlash. Now, the purpose of my presentation today is to make sense of, of this rise in the correctional population. And if you look at the next figure, figure three, again, I import from figure two the measure of the US correctional population as a share of the total population. So that is in the bottom. And that's against the left-hand scale. And on the top, I'm measuring the rate of change of that ratio. So each observation in the top series shows you by how much the correctional population as a share of the total increased from the previous year. For example, in 1940, the correctional population as a share of the total fell by about 10% relative to 1939. And in 1980, it rose by about 10%. And that's more or less the two boundaries between which the share of the correctional population fluctuated over much of the 20th century. And the question I'd like to ask is, what caused the correctional population to remain fairly stable up until the late 1970s, early 1980s? What caused it to zoom, to rise very rapidly since the beginning of the 1980s? And why is it leveling off now? These are the questions that I'd like to address. Now, these types of questions were never asked until the 1930s. Uh, crime and punishment was a subject that was held, handled by novelists, uh, by legal experts, by doctors, by psychologists, by philosophers, by moralists. All of those people dealt with crime and punishment, but political economists did not. They did not ask these questions, and they certainly did not investigate and answer them. The first to have done so was a German political economist by the name of Georg Gruschke. Now, 
I suppose most of you have not heard of Georg Rusche, so maybe I should give you a very brief introduction. Uh, Rusche was born in the year 1900 in Germany, and he got his PhD in economics in, 19, in the early 1920s. And his PhD was uh, focusing on the labor market. That was his main interest. But he also got involved in prison work. So he was contemplating the connection between the labor market and penality. This is something he was getting interested in. And the Frankfurt School commissioned uh, Rusche in the early 30s to write a research project on the subject. And in 1933, he published a very short article in which he laid down his hypothesis as well as his major historical findings. And then it took him about six additional years to complete the full manuscript, which he co-published with somebody else. And it's quite a turbulent story. In 39, he published that book. It's called Punishment and Social Structure. Now, the argument that he made in that book was that political economy, sorry, that crime and punishment is simply too important to be left out of political economy. It has to be anchored, he argued, in economic theory. And that, so that's the economic part. And it has to be anchored in the class struggle. So that's the political part. It has to be historicized. So you have to study its evolution over a long, uh, a long period of time, different epochs. And he then asked, what kind of basic propositions, what kind of suppositions should a researcher adopt in order to investigate the connection uh, or the political economy of crime and punishment? And he came with four propositions. Now, I will explain those propositions, but uh, I need to preamble them by saying that some of them may sound uh, liberal to you or may sound materialistic to you or mainstream. But remember, he's writing in the 30s, he's breaking new grounds, and he's a Marxist. So the materialistic bent is very popular during that period. OK. Now, the first proposition he made has to do with the purpose of punishment. Why is there state punishment? And to answer that proposition or that question, he asked, what is crime? Well, the most simple definition of crime is that crime is uh, are acts that are forbidden by society. So the first purpose of punishment is to deter people from committing crime. It's quite trivial nowadays, but he felt that he needed to make that supposition. The second premise has to do with how do you actually deter people from committing crime. And that uh, could be framed under, in our terms, under the title, the Bentham-like title of the calculus of pleasure and pain. You have to persuade prospected criminals that crime doesn't pay. And how do you do that? Well, economists today would say you have to persuade them that the expected pain from being caught for the crime and punished is greater than the expected gain of engaging in the crime. The third uh, question that he asked is, how do you actually persuade the population that crime doesn't pay, that that is, in fact, the condition? And here he began by saying that if we observe societies throughout history, we see that most of the crime takes place at the lower strata of society. And why? Because the living conditions, they are hard. And uh, people basically engage in crime partly for reasons of uh, subsistence. So the penalty for crime has to be more severe than the lowest conditions at the lower part of society. Uh, Rusche paraphrases Bernard Shaw. Uh, if I can remember that correctly, he says that if the prison does not outbid in misery the slums, the slums will empty and the prison will fill, which is quite obvious because 
if you are contemplating engaging in crime and the conditions in prison are better than your existing conditions, well, either you are successful and not caught, or if you get caught, you end up in a better place than before. So that's no deterrence. So the argument is deterrence has to be generating conditions that are more severe than the lowest conditions in society. The fourth and final uh, precondition that Rouchet outlines has to do with the question of <laughs> what determines the lowest conditions in society. And he says that many things determine the lowest conditions in society, but if we are to zero on one of them, the most important one, that has to do with the labor market, and it has to do essentially with unemployment. Unemployment determines the income at the lowest level of society. It determines it has an effect on the wage rates at the lowest end of society. And as a consequence, it will also determine the level of penalty and the penal system. So unemployment is what we need to look at in order to understand the living conditions. Now, using these four propositions, he then went out to uh, outline two extreme cases. One extreme case is if you have massive excess supply of labor. For example, China at the turn of the 20th century, you have a massive pool of unemployed workers. Conditions at the lower parts of society are very harsh. They are really very close to physical subsistence. The only way you can deter people from committing crime under those situations is by killing them. So execution is something quite common, commonplace in China at the time. That's one extreme. The other extreme is massive excess demand for labor. And he gives uh, the example of mercantilism in the 17th century, where uh, you had a lot of demand for labor. And that is the period that we see penal reform. This is the, 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 the period in which we see uh, the institutionalization of forced labor, forcing people to work, actually, uh, within the penal system. So he outlines these two extremes, either execution or some form of humane system that uh, treats prisoners trying to deter them, but nevertheless not in such a harsh way. And his purpose in his research is to flesh out history as it moves between these two logical extremes. And his argument is that in this analysis, we have to examine what uh, the Israeli calls the two nations of the poor and the rich, and Marx calls the class struggle. And we should focus on different epochs. And in each epoch, we should look at what are the conditions of the labor market, what are the features of crime, and what is the nature of punishment. So let me go through uh, these several epochs that uh, Ruche describes in his work. He begins with the early Middle Ages. And he says that the basic condition in the early Middle Ages uh, are that you have a lot of land and you have a, lim a small population. So the ratio of labor to the uh, means of production to labor, if you like, is very, very uh, small. Uh, and therefore, there's not enough labor. There's excess demand for labor. And most of the crime during that period is not crime of property. It's crime of passion. Uh, and the way of punishment is relying on things such as revenge, uh, penance, and fines. Then he moves to the late Middle Ages and argues that the situation inverts. The ratio of labor to land rises. There is an abundance of labor. And this is a period you start seeing armies of beggars roaming uh, the countryside. Uh, there is a rise in property crime. And highway robbery becomes rampant. And that's the period in which punishment becomes much crueler. Then he moves to the 17th century, the period of mercantilism. And then the situation again changes. We have now excess demand for labor. For a long period of time, plagues and uh, wars and all sorts of natural disasters dwindle the population. But at the same time, the advent of uh, trade with mercantilism raises the demand for labor. So it's a classic condition of excess demand for labor. And this is where the Enlightenment uh, kicks in. We have a more humane way of treating 
prisoners, we have prison reform, we have imprisonment actually being institutionalized, and we have the beginning of forced labor institutionalized in prisons. Then he moves to the Industrial Revolution, the 18th century, and the situation again reverses. Uh, massive mechanization makes labor more and more abundant. Marx speaks about the reserve army of the unemployed. And crime is rising. Property crime is rising, and punishment becomes Dickensian, quite more cruel. He then shifts to uh, America in the 19th century, and here we have a massive process of industrialization. Uh, we have plenty of land. We have an abundant, uh, not an abundant necessarily, but an influx of uh, people coming, especially from Europe, but not at a rapid enough pace to uh, fill all the so-called vacancies. So we have, again, a classic situation of labor being scarce. So crime in that period in North America is fairly low, and we have p a prison reform in full swing. We have conditional um, <coughs> sentencing. We have probation and parole experience for the first time, according to Rouchet. And we also have, for the first time, scientists trying to examine why crime takes place. What are the causes of crime? And trying to figure out if welfare reform can actually abate crime. He also makes an interesting comparison between the United States and Germany during the Great Depression of the 1930s. And he says that in the United States, labor unions were weaker than in Germany at the during that period. And as a consequence, the conditions of life were worse in the United States. And therefore, the penal system was harsher in the United States than in Germany. And finally, in this brief exposition. He's one of the first to uh, predict the theoretical basis of the concentration camp by saying the totalitarian regimes that would embark on a rearmament drive and they have a need for uh, significant increases in the labor force will resort to forced incarceration and concentration camps. So obviously, this is very innovative work. Is the first one to deal with that. And he comes out with this kind of uh, set of mind-boggling ideas for the time. Very impressive, at least in my opinion. Nonetheless, until the 1970s, late 1970s, Russia remains completely unknown. Uh, he has no impact on the mainstream of criminology, no impact on the mainstream of uh, sociology, no impact on economics, of course. And in 1950, in the early 1950s, he kills himself. He commits suicide. His recognition came only in the 1970s and 1980s. And it has to do with the rise, I think, with the rise of crime in the United States uh, and with the rise of punishment in the United States. And we have a period in which the data on these processes become more available. So data are collected more systematically and published. We also have the advance of cheaper and cheaper computing. So you can actually s research the subject with greater rigor, and it's more accessible to more people. So you start seeing in that period critical uh, sociologists and radical criminologists starting to investigate Rouchet. Uh, and some of them go beyond investigating Russia and actually going into researching the subject uh, in the spirit of his thesis. And what they find is that in, from a longer term perspective, Russia's analysis is very fruitful. It's very innovative. It gives rise to many hypotheses, many insights. So they find it uh, very generative. But in the shorter term, there is uh, quite a lot of disagreement of how useful Rouge is. And I think that some of the disagreement and discontent has to do with this figure. This is our interpretation of that discontent. This is figure four. And in this figure, what we see is, again, uh, I'm importing the correctional population, which most sociologists and criminologists who study the subject from uh, Rouge's perspective use as a measure of punishment. 
And that is plotted against the right-hand scale. And against the left-hand scale, I'm introducing a new variable, and that's the rate of unemployment, the proportion of the labor force that is willing to work but, and, and looking for work but is unable to find work. So that's the rate of unemployment. And what you can see in this chart perhaps is the reason why the analysis a la Russia becomes problematic. Because up until the 1980s, you see a fairly uh, significant correlation. It's not perfectly tight, but it's nevertheless positive between the rate of unemployment and the fluctuations in the correctional population. So up until the early 1980s, Ruscher's analysis or thesis seems to hold quite well. But then it breaks down. From the beginning of neoliberalism, the 1980s, we have a decline in unemployment, quite a significant decline in unemployment. But at the same time, the correctional population zooms. So from that point onward, uh, it seems that the Ruscher thesis breaks down. And there are a lot of debates in the sociological and criminal, uh, uh, criminology literature about why that might be the case, and all sorts of additional models being created more sophisticated, more complex, more subtle, more specific. All sorts of cultural analysis are brought in, uh, additional variables, the sort of hard materialism of Russia breaks down. The models become, uh, if you like, infested with other considerations. Now, I think that this uh, dismissal of the Russia thesis is way too premature. And it's premature in a very important sense that uh, a lot of the analysis, and I am by no means an expert on criminality. I'm not a, a criminologist uh, at all, and I'm not a labor economist. This is not a subject that I consider myself an expert on. But uh, many of the articles that I did read uh, left me underwhelmed in terms of the research methods that uh, are used in order to test or in order to explore propositions. People are just quite happy to throw in variables. And if it works fine, if it doesn't, they just reject whatever they did not find. Uh, often, the analysis is not very thoughtful, I find. And the, the danger with, with not being very thoughtful when you do empirical theoretical analysis is you, know, you always have decision trees when you make, you ask questions and you answer. And then you answer a question and you say, this is the answer. And you continue to go this way. And in fact, you should have answered or choose this answer. And if you had, then you would move in a completely different direction. So every choice is very, very important. And if you're not careful in those choices, or if you're not engaged in empirical analysis to begin with to substantiate your ideas about the world, uh, you can offer, <laughs> often go on a tangent, and very quickly not on a tangent, in a completely different direction altogether. I think that this may be what was happening here. You see. The correctional population, the level of the correctional population as a percent of the total population is not a good measure of penality at any point in time. And why is that? Because the level of the correctional population is affected by two factors. It is affected by the deep history of crime and punishment. So how much crime was there in the past and what kind of punishment was in the past determines the level of the correctional population last year. This year, the level of the correctional population is last year's level plus the addition and deletion from the correctional population. Now, if you are thinking of how conditions in the labor market affect penality, you should look only at the rate of change and what happened last year versus this year, rather than on the entire level of the correctional population. So we need to look at the rate of change of the series rather than at the level of the series. And it's a, a fundamental difference. It's a very simple difference. But if you don't think about it uh, and you don't draw this conclusion, obviously, you draw the conclusion that Russia, since the 1980, uh, 1980s, actually breaks down. So if you look at the next chart, figure 5, you see the consequence of making that decision to look at the rate of change rather than the level. So I'm using, again, the level of unemployment in red and 
This time, not the level of the correctional population as a share of the overall population, but the rate of change of this ratio. Now, what you see here is a different story altogether. What you see here is a correlation that is extremely tight between these two phenomena. It seems that Ruscha was more right than he could have anticipated. You don't need complicated models. You don't need additional variables. You don't need qualitative discussions. I mean, you might want to add them, but you don't need them. You don't need excuses for why your models do not work. It's quite simple. I mean, most of the time, he was right on. He was hitting the nail right on the head. There is a very, very tight correlation between changes in the penal system and unemployment. It's quite amazing correlation, with two exceptions. The first exception is the first systemic crisis of the 1930s. The second exception is the current systemic crisis. What we see in these two periods is that the relationship actually breaks down. We see in the 1930s that unemployment zooms to 25% or something like that, but the rate of change of the correctional population as a percent of the total actually decelerates. And then when unemployment falls, the rate of change of the correctional population rises. This is all still in the Great Depression. And we see a similar situation recently. So since 2008, we see a massive increase in unemployment, but for some reason, we see the correctional population actually going into negative territory. This is not just deceleration, it actually is falling. So we have two interesting, very interesting things in this chart. We have first a confirmation of the Ruscha thesis in the United States for much of the 20th century with two glaring exceptions in which the, in which the relationship actually is the opposite of what you would expect. Now, how do we go about investigating what is going on here? So in order to do that, I'm going to use uh, a couple of equations. And you don't need to be mathematicians to comprehend the brief explanation that I will give here. You just follow. If, if, if you haven't taken ever calculus one, it's OK. You can still understand what I'm saying. Uh, in mathematics, we often use a dot above the variable to indicate a temporal rate of change. So a variable with a dot on it would indicate, say, the percent change or the decimal rate of change of that variable from a previous period, say, from 2009 to 2010 it grew by 10%. So 10% will be the measure of the rate of change of the level of the variable, and we use a dot on it to indicate it. So here I'm interested in what is the rate of change of the share of the correctional population in the overall population. And in mathematics, we know that this is approximately equal. And don't ask me why it's not exactly equal, because then I will have to go into calculus one, and I will not do it here. Uh, it's approximately equal to the rate of change of the numerator of the ratio, in this case, less the rate of change of the denominator of, of the ratio. So in this case, if you take the rate at which the correctional population is growing and subtract from it the rate at which the population is growing, you get more or less approximately the overall rate of change of this ratio on the left. OK. Now, if the overall population changes, but it changes at a pretty stable rate, so say 2% give or take 0.2, so between 2.2 or 1.8% or every year, it changes, but relatively stable. Most of the fluctuations on the left-hand side will be determined by the changes in the correctional population, which changes much more. Uh, in a much more volatile way. So I'm going to concentrate only on the left-hand side or the left variable in this equation, the rate of change of the correctional population. So that's equation two. And to compute a rate of change of a variable, you simply take 
the amount of change from last year, so by how much the correctional population changed from one year to the other, and you divide it by the level of the correctional population. You do that all the time. You ask yourself, by how much your salary increased from last year, so you take the difference between this year and last year, and you divide it by the salary last year. So it's only 2%, unfortunately, rather than 7%. Right? Uh, so we do the same thing. Whenever we want rate of change, we take the difference between two observations and divide it by the initial observation. Okay. Now, in the second line of that equation, um, engage in some sort of a dirty trick, which has no effect on the mathematics, but it has effect on the meaning of the equation. I take the correctional population over, sorry, the change in the correctional population over the correctional population, and I divide and multiply it by the same variable. So I divide by crime and multiply by crime, as you can see, and then I divide by the overall population and multiply by the overall population. If you take any number and you multiply it and divide it by the same number, you leave it unchanged. So essentially, the second line of the equation and the first line of the equation are the same mathematically. But what we have done is to take one ratio and decompose it to three different ratios. And why do we do it? Because it's meaningful. So it's tautological, but it's useful to figure out what the components are. It's like you know, your body is made of several components. So you can say, this is my body. Or you can say, my body is made of my head, my limbs, my torso, etc. Same thing we do here. This is the rate of change, but we examine the components of that rate of change. Now, the change in the correctional population over the level of crime, I argue, is a measure of the intensity of punishment. Because it says, for every crime being committed, how many people are added net to the correctional population. So that's a measure of the intensity of punishment. We will come back to it. Crime overall over the overall population is just the crime rate. So we have here in the numerator the crime rate. And finally, the overall population divided by the correctional population is just the inverse of the correctional population in the overall population. I'm going to ignore it in my presentation. And I'm going to concentrate only on these two elements. I'm going to concentrate on the crime rate and the intensity of punishment to figure out why the correctional population is rising or has been rising. So again, we are trying to figure out what happens to the correctional population. And we thinking, well, it will be effect affected by the crime rate as well as by the severity of punishment. All right, so let's move to the next figure, figure six. Figure six shows two rates. One is the so-called serious crime rate, and the other is the murder rate. So let's begin with serious crime. Serious crime is a set of crimes that is defined by the FBI to include homicide, murder, rape, aggravated assault, robbery, and certain forms of theft. So if you embezzle funds, it's not considered serious crime. It's not white color crime. Uh, the FBI standardize, standardizes those data and aggregates them, and it, it, it comes with a total number that it calls the number of serious crimes in every period. And then it divides that by the population to get the serious crime rate. And here it is expressed against the left-hand scale per 10,000 persons. So if you look at the beginning of the series, that's the black series, in 1960, there are about 200 crimes for every 10,000 persons. So that's a crime rate of about 2%. Well, in this case, exactly 2%. And we see that since the 60s going towards the 1980s, 
the crime rate soars. And in the 1980s, in early 1980s, it reaches about 600 per 10,000, so that's about 6%. So it triples over a 20 year period. And at that point in time, criminologists and sociologists are screaming that the skies are falling. Politicians are contemplating the disintegration of the fabric of American society because they're always thinking this is going to continue. It didn't. You can see that uh, exactly when they're contemplating the end of the world for the United States, the crime rate levels off and then it falls down. And in fact, uh, there's quite a lot of literature uh, about how everybody was surprised. They're all sort of caught with their pens down in predicting the exact opposite of what has happened. Nowadays, the crime rate is about half of its uh, peak in the 1980s and 90s. Now, we don't have data going back earlier, but we do have data for the murder rate. This is in, in the thin red light, uh, line. And you can see that there's a major difference in the magnitude. For example, in 1980, you have 600 uh, serious crimes per 10,000 persons, but you have only one murder. So it's, it's a completely different order of magnitude. But you can also see that there is a very tight correlation between the two series. And if that correlation, in fact, existed prior to the 1960s, we can see that the crime rate is a cyclical, a long-term cyclical phenomenon in the United States. It's, it's not just going one way. Why is it that everybody missed uh, this trajectory? Because maybe they were not looking at the right causes. OK. Now, bearing that cyclicality in mind, let's move to the next figure, figure 7. Now, as I've done before, I'm importing constantly a uh, series from one chart to the next to make it easier for you so you have somebody you know already. And the series I'm importing from the previous one is the series crime rate. But this time, again, to make your life easier, I'm expressing it not in the original numbers of the FBI, which is for 10,000 people, but per 100 people. So it is immediately understood as percent. And that's against the left-hand scale. So it's the same series. But of course, if you change the axis, the series seems flatter. But it's exactly the same numbers. The axes are just different. Now, I'm superimposing on that against the other scale, against the right-hand scale, the intensity of punishment. And that's a slightly more involved variable here. If you go back to your equation, you'll notice that the intensity of punishment is measured in two steps. The first is to measure the number of people added net or subtracted or deleted net from the correctional population. So for example, in 2010, there were 157,000 people removed from the correctional population. So it was a decline of 157,000 people. That means that if you take the number of people coming into the correctional population, subtract from that number the number of people released from it, you get minus 157,000. So more people were actually released. Now, you take that number, you divide it by the number of crimes in that year. And what you get for 2010 is about minus 1.5, which means that for every 100 crimes, there was 1.5 persons released from the correctional population. Now, that doesn't mean that it's always on a release basis, because we saw that the correctional population was rising. So most of the numbers are positive. For example, in 2000, the number is 3, which means that for every 100 crimes, there were 3 people added to the correctional population. Now, what does that number represent? It is a synthetic variable that represents several things. It represents the zeal and the effectiveness of the police in catching criminals. 
some of you may have seen the series, uh, TV series, The Wire, and if you haven't, uh, you should. Uh, so this is about how you cook up the numbers. I mean, it's about many other things. It's a microcosm of American society, but, but just for that thing. So how effective is the police in actually catching criminals? Secondly, what is the nature of the legal code? You know, what kind of penalties are being imposed on criminals? Thirdly, the severity of the uh, legal system in actually sentencing people. And thirdly, the number of people who are released due to uh, past incarceration, past punishment, and so on. So all of those things come into that variable. It's, in, it's a synthetic variable. But nevertheless, it measures to some extent, I think, the extent to which society penalizes uh, people in any one year. And if you relate it to the number of crimes, you end up with the intensity of punishment relative to the crimes being committed in that year. Now, this is a very interesting figure in a sense that you see that the two uh, processes are very, very uh, tightly correlated. Both the extent of crime and the level of punishment are rising up until the 1980s and 1990s, and both of them are declining afterwards. And remember Rusha's simple hypothesis that both the crime and the punishment are associated with unemployment in the same way. So this sounds or looks quite consistent with this argument. And the next stage is basically to ask, well, how do each of these processes relate to unemployment, as he argues? So that's what I'm doing in the next couple of figures. Figure eight imports the serious crime rate from the previous couple of charts. That's a, a on the right-hand scale. And it also imports unemployment from a previous chart. So you already know these two variables. And you can see that, sure enough, the two are positively correlated. They are rising up until the 1980s, and they are falling from the 1980s onwards. But we also see what we saw in figure five, uh, this mysterious situation that exists in the last few years where unemployment is zooming, but it seems that crime continues to decline. So that's kind of an enigma. And that enigma is not only in the aggregate, but it's also in the disaggregate numbers. And, and then the next chart shows you a similar relationship existing between unemployment and the severity of punishment. And here, too, we see the two are positively correlated. They are both rising. Well, they are falling up until the late 60s. They are rising up until the 80s, the early 80s. And then they are again declining. Uh, the correlation from the early 80s onwards is not as tight as it was previously. But even in this not so tight correlation, we can see the anomaly in the last few years. Again, unemployment is soaring. and the intensity of punishment is dropping like a stone. So again, there's an enigma here. All right, so what do we make of, of these findings? How do we take stock and wrap up this kind of discussion? So let me remind you what I try to do. I try to situate crime and punishment in the United States within the notion of capital as power rather than capital as some sort of an economic category, and to try to understand what the limits on that power might be. And uh, we started this kind of broader analysis a few years ago when we examined the current crisis, characterizing it not as a regular crisis of production, consumption, employment, or profit, but a systemic crisis, a crisis that strikes the very possibility of capitalism and that elicits systemic fear on part of dominant capital and capitalists in general. And then the year after, we examined the objective circumstances that make capitalists fearful for the system. Uh, we argue that capitalists uh, are engaged in a power process that is a deterministic power process. They have to inflict damage. They have to exert sabotage on society because that's the nature of accumulation. They have no choice. 
So in order to accumulate more, they have to inflict more damage. And more damage elicits more resistance. So essentially, there is some, at some point, you reach a limit beyond which you cannot inflict more damage without transforming the society either uh, towards a crisis or towards some sort of a massive retaliation. Now, in this presentation, I try to examine the underbelly of that process, the process of resistance. And I said that in the past, most of the analysis of resistance were focused on production, were focused on labor unions, were focused on workers, on demonstration, on political mobilization of productive classes and, and allied classes. Uh, but there was a shift with the uh, weakening of Marxism in the 1970s and 1980s. There emerged a new fashion of uh, emphasizing cultural and ethnicity which a uh, large part of were anti-socialist, anti-enlightenment, and anti-deterministic. Uh, essentially, they replaced determinism with subjectivism. Uh, but at the same time, they eliminated, in my opinion, meaning and significance for much of the analysis. Because if everything is just power, uh, and there is no uh, question of what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is false, then exactly what conclusions can we draw? It could be that we, them, we ourselves are just imposing power on you, the listeners. What I try to do here is to go back and say, no, capitalism is a deterministic logic. It imposes itself on society. Not all logics are deterministic, but this one is. And there is always resistance to power. Power is no meaning without resistance. If there is no resistance, you cannot speak about power. So that's a sort of a basic uh, dialectical principle that you always define something through negation. However, not all resistance is made equal. There is some resistance that is autonomous. Resistance that comes from outside the system in some important sense. For example, 1968 in Paris, in my opinion, is autonomous resistance. It's resistance that cannot be predicted and was not predicted by anybody, including not the people at the center, including not people such as Castoriadis, who was you know, very involved with a uh, sort of inner circle, circle that moved the 1968 uprising. The 1988 uh, and 89 intifada in uh, sorry, 87 and 88 intifada in Palestine, was again something that could not have been predicted easily from within the logic of capital. And, and nobody actually predicted it. But most resistances to capitalism are not autonomous. They are heteronymous. They are part of that system. And they can be predicted. They are actually not initiating. They're reacting. They are responses to the system. And I think that crime is one such resistance. It's a resistance that is part of capitalism, and it's part of perhaps other modes of power prior to capitalism. So in my opinion, and uh, in the work that I, um, uh, I've been doing with Shimshon on the subject, we need to examine crime and punishment as part of the capitalist mode of power. But to do so, we need a different frame of reference. Uh, when you think about capitalism as a mode of production, then you think about unemployment belonging to economics and crime and punishment belonging to the sphere of politics and the sphere of the state. And they are interacting with one another, but they belong to do two different uh, realms. And they have their own categories that they have to be un uh, understood uh, as belonging to two different categories. Ruscha is trying to actually bring them together, but he is still working and thinking within the Marxist framework. And he's still thinking about the mode of production. And therefore, in my opinion, uh, this kind of analysis can be greatly improved. We are suggesting to think of that uh, process, the process of processes of crime and punishment, as part of the mode of power, and to think of forms of sabotage. If 
accumulation is about capitalizing power, then power is about inflicting damage of creating sabotage, creating pain. What kind of sabotage do we have in that system? Well, we have many. The first and perhaps most obvious one is the sabotage against creativity. Creativity is the positive resistance to capital. What people under capital are doing is to create things. The way to control creativity and therefore to accumulate is to inflict threats, to inflict damage, sabotage on creativity in order to create it, to control it and mold it. And the most effective way to do it, the most effective way to subjugate creativity and creativity, I don't mean just inventing gadgets, I mean creativity and ordering the social system is the threat of unemployment. It's the most serious threat that can be to most working people is that you don't have means of livelihood. So you have creative resistance to capitalism and the sabotage against it is unemployment. So that's the positive side. Penality is the negative, sorry, crime is the negative resistance against capitalism. And penalty, punishment, state punishment, imprisonment, etc., is the way to contain that negative resistance to capitalism. So we have two forms of resistance, creative, positive, uh, destructive, negative, and both of them are contained, one by unemployment, the other by state penalty. Now, this kind of an idea about two forms of sabotage, I think, can fit into our analysis of the regimes of differential accumulation, although I'm not specifying it here, but I think it can be examined in that way. Uh, we exp uh, expressed uh, two ways in which differential accumulation by dominant capital can take place. One is depth and the other is breadth. And depth has to do with accumulation through crisis. Capital can accumulate quite effectively through crisis, and we call that depth. And depth is uh, accompanied and, in fact, conditioned and entertained through massive doses of sabotage uh, that uh, materialize in capitalism through the process of stagflation, stagnation and inflation. And stagnation, as you all know, comes together with unemployment. So we have one engine that is operating during a depth regime. That's the engine of unemployment, stagnation, inflation, or stagflation. And what I've shown today is that together with unemployment, together with stagflation, there is another engine that works, another form of sabotage, and that's penalty. And both of them are rising up until the early 1980s during the depth regime. And then both of them are receding during the breath regime, the movements towards expansion, that happened since the late 1980s and early 90s. Finally, the enigma. How do we sort out, and I carry you one more time back to figure five, and I will end with that. How do we explain this enigma, uh, the breakdown of the connection between unemployment and penalty, between these two forms of sabotage that the capitalist order inflicts on the underlying population? Why is it that the relationship breaks down in the 30s and then again in the 2000s? Well, we could think of three possibilities. The first possibility is that the data are uh, inaccurate. Either the, the data are collected inappropriately by the various administrations that collate them all the way from uh, the police to the FBI to the penal system, or that we are uh, uh, basically using the data in a wrong way, we messed up the facts. So that's a possibility. And it often happens to people who do research. You know, people who don't do research never make any mistakes. So. Uh, these mistakes can happen. The second possibility is that this is a, simply a too crude a model. This is a top-down model. It basically uh, lumps together two, three variables and tries to explain the world with it. Well, maybe it's too crude. So it's possible that if we have a more sophisticated analysis, if we uh, 
uh, change the way that we measure unemployment, change the way we measure crime, change the way that we measure uh, the penal uh, sanction, then put it all together, the uh, enigmas will disappear. It's possible. We haven't done that, and that's certainly a possibility. But what I'd like to emphasize today, although I'm not sure that that's the, the most powerful explanation, but I'd like to think it is, and that's a possibility, is that systemic crisis, in other words, these two highlighted periods, might be periods which actually change the rules of the game and change the rules of the game in an important way. Because, you see, under normal conditions of business as usual, most people at the lower uh, or the bottom of society uh, face a condition of no way out. And that's why we call the presentation No Way Out. Many of them have no jobs or uh, are, face a risk of losing their jobs. Having a long history of being jobless or coming from, from a family of joblessness, living in regions or areas where joblessness is rampant, uh, many of them lose their dignity and self-worth. And their response is actually to uh, contest society, to reject society, uh, and to do so individualistically and to do so in the way of violent defiance. So it's not just about subsistence. It's not just about making a buck. It's not just about showing that I can do better and be rich. It's about a reaction against society. It's a protestation, a negative protestation, an individualistic protestation of society. But it could be that systemic crises create some sort of a transformative alternative to people at the lower stratas of society. And I don't want to use the word class here deliberately because uh, it's a very loaded term. Uh, it's possible that under those conditions of systemic crisis, people at the very low end of society realize that they're not very different from the people just above them. Because much of the crime is, is directed to people with a little property just above uh, the criminals. Uh, they realize that, in fact, they and the remaining 99% are on the same boat. And that's why the slogan of the 1% versus the 99% was striking such a massive chord. Because to a lot of people, suddenly it made sense. Even if I'm kind of at the middle of society, I'm just part of the 99%. I'm a nobody. So people at the very bottom, as well as people slightly above them, realize that they're not that different. That actually might create a possibility in the mind of people otherwise susceptible to crime, that there is a possibility of not just defying the system individualistically and in a violent way, but perhaps transforming it. And possibly, and this is just a hypothesis, although I know that some criminologists have been uh, thinking and working about it, because this is not exactly our idea. We heard it. Uh, from uh, a criminologist we spoke with, and he made that suggestion, that that's a possibility. The possibility being that although unemployment is rising, the crisis is changing the mindset of the lower strata of society in such a way that perhaps it uh, reduces the incentive for crime in favor of something uh, more systematic to change society. So i leave it at that. Thank you. For questions, I think there's just two requests. Since this is being recorded, we'd like, if possible, for you to ask your question into this microphone. And also, I think we'll take questions one at a time. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so volunteers first. Very fascinating presentation. Um, I'm just curious about one aspect of figure two, which is what you started with, which showed the uh, uh, percentage of uh, top 10 percent income, which had two peaks, one in the uh, 1920s and the other recently. And that compared to the um, correctional population, it only has one peak. So what changed between the 1920s on this graph, in your opinion, and the 19, 2000s? I have no idea. But you do agree that I agree. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I have no idea. Thank you. 
I've been giving the, given the task of reporting on this experience, which by the way, for me is a rare experience because we don't get to hear social science very much in political theory. Uh, <laughs> I have the task of reporting on this to uh, a political theorist of the Frankfurt School variety, my brother, and a mathematician, his son, my nephew. Uh, so I just have two <laughs> little questions. And one of them is, uh, how do you spell the name of that German economist? Oh, Shea? okay. So it's G-E-O-R-G-R-U-S-C, so R-U-S-C-H-E. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the other one is, uh, has this or will it soon be published in a form which uh, I could uh, pass on to these two uh, intellectuals? Yes, in the next few weeks, sure, okay. it will. All right. Did you put it on there? Um, okay, <clears throat> sorry. So Jonathan, I've almost, I almost get this, but I don't quite get it. And I'm not surprised. Um, what, I know there's something really, you're doing something really strongly political here. And I'm sorry I have to ask what it is, but <laughs> I, <laughs> I'd really like to know what it is, because I know you're redefining how one understands um, resistance and also the points of resistance. I get that. And also how under one understands not sort of class identification, but identification, and I don't know what you want to call it, because I also don't want to go um, to sort of the, the cultural and, and ethnicity or... So, can, so it's a really honest question. What is it that... What is the real political takeaway with this? And how does it, I know it, it redefines how we understand probably action and reaction to the social system. Does that make sense or no? I'm having trouble asking this question actually. Uh, <coughs> well, I think I'm going to help back here. <laughs> you know what's going on. Uh, let me let me ask you to ask this question again. Okay. Uh, no, not now. After okay. somebody else asks more questions, okay. and then come back to it. Fair enough. So you you can define it better, and maybe in the back of my mind, I, I can uh, sort of anticipate an answer better. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just a clarifying question to the last part of your presentation um, between the, the the individualistic reaction uh, to the, to these forms of sabotage and the more collective transformative mm -hmm. alternative. Does that imply, do you define crime as an individualistic enterprise? Or is, uh, like, what would change if, if we saw crime as a highly collective form of organizing or acting? Okay, w uh, qu quite obviously, uh, there are, uh, criminal activities that are highly organized and there are criminal activities that are highly disorganized. So there is a full range. So you can go all the way from organized crime, so the Italian mafia or the Russian war or, you know, you, you can basically, uh, or the, the, the uh, drug cartels in Colombia, etc. Or you can go to, you know, individualistic crimes, burglary, murder, uh, you know, uh, aggravated assault, rape, and those things, they're not necessarily organized crime. Uh, I don't go here, I'm not a criminologist, and, I, and this is an area that is certainly not my area of expertise, so uh, what I'm uh, suggesting here is that in the aggregate, uh, most of the crimes that will actually be reported and sentenced I would speculate that uh, they're not part of the organized crime because these are the most effective criminals. Uh, usually they're intertwined with um, uh, white collar crime and you know the police never goes to uh, the city of London just as it never or rarely goes to the favela, uh, favelas in, in, in Brazil. This is the most, the most dangerous terrain. So this is where the high crime, the high organized crime, all the money laundering taking place, these things often do not end up reported as serious crime or uh, sentence, judge sentence and so on. So I, I would uh, 
expect most of the fluctuations in crime to reflect uh, fluctuations in disorganized crime rather than organized crime. But obviously this is not uh, a highly informed suggestion. That is a hypothesis that I'm uh, floating here. Again, I haven't investigated it. So I do not claim here that uh, organized crime can be modified in that way, not at all. So you are not going to change the way that organized crime operates because there is a systemic crisis. If anything, they will probably use it to their own advantage to penetrate even deeper. I'm talking about the disorganized aspects of crime. OK. Is this? OK, good. I haven't done this before. Um, so I want to go back to Hugh's question on the figure two, I think, where the, there's a difference. And yeah. I, um, my question would be that there are other kinds of institutions that existed certainly up to that point and then slowly after that point until the 80s where they finally were no longer existing for the mentally ill, for those that were no longer or who were unable to, to cope with society. So not just in the States but all over, but I know you're looking at the, the United mm -hmm. States. So I guess I'm asking, did you look at those institutions as penal institutions as well? Not or at all. Would those be groups of people that would then come out and now be part of this kind of crime and at the lower bottom? Could very well be. I, I haven't examined it at all. No. To me, that well, seems like there would be it. an interesting larger be. amount of. Sure, uh, it uh, could be. Yeah. Uh, what we were trying to do is to go to the most simple propositions rather than the most complicated propositions. So. There we have this thesis that argues that capital is power. And therefore, what gets capitalized, what you see in the stock market, essentially is not about production. It's about the control of production. And the control of production, production understood very, very broadly, has to do with threat, with sabotage, with pain. And we need to see the manifestations of those things. So one manifestation is unemployment. Another manifestation is penalty. A third manifestation is the food that you eat. The fourth manifestation is the ecology. I mean, there are endless manifestations. And this is just one way of saying, let's take it one step at a time and show to ourselves or ask ourselves, are these forms of power connected to the redistribution of income, to the differential accumulation, to the processes of capitalist power? So we are taking it very, very gradually and trying to be as systematic as we can, not to make those colossal mistakes that you run very quickly and you already know everything before you even started. We don't. So we take it very slowly. So the answer to your question and perhaps many other questions will be, I really don't know. Uh, we started really uh, in the most simplest of terms, and that's what you see is, is what we know, actually, about it. So I, I don't have an answer to your question, but maybe some of the younger students here will give us those answers uh, in a couple of years. Um, okay, I, 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 really, I really found myself provoked by a lot of different things here. It was quite stimulating. Um, and clearly, one, one thing, I'm, I'm a comparativist, so, um, one thing that would interest me would be to see if in similar free market style societies, i.e. Canada, Australia, mm -hmm. Britain, you would see similar patterns because if it has to do with broader economic trends, one might expect to see some kind of similar patterns. Right. Although, as you rightly noted, you would never see the kind of fluctuations you see with regard to the United States because it starts at such a high level. But if you historicize mm -hmm. it and you start with whatever their base is, it might show very, very similar patterns. So, so that would be interesting. One thing that, that emerges just looking at this particular figure five, um, and again, it, it's so provocative, is you see the really big drop in the correctional population. And taking off from your earlier, actually one of your concluding comments about going to the point of individualistic responses to, um, to unemployment and individual, um, individualistic responses to crisis, well, you know, when you look at the United States and you see a sudden drop right around the 1940s, um, you know, one possibility simply is that there was a collective response that was huge, and that was following the sit-ins and everything else. The, there was a trade union movement that really exploded and that took a lot of people out of an individualistic mode and put them into a collective mode of response. So that might be one hypothesis worth exploring, right? Uh, but, but in the 1940s, you have... 
a drop in unemployment, massive drop in unemployment. So a lot of people are working. I mean, the well, incentive exactly. to, go, to go to go to engage in crime is much reduced under those circumstances. But sure, I'm not saying that's the only thing. No, Who for sure, yeah. for sure. And and also then you also get the war, right? Which is also going to dramatically reduce mm -hmm. unemployment. Right, that's um, what it did. And in fact, dramatically reduce. Um, th there are a lot. You know, they're they're like apocryphal stories, but there are a lot of people who had options. You know, you go to jail or you join the army, and mm -hmm. guess what? You know, you join the army. It's um, the the risk might be higher, but also you don't get the the penalty. Yeah, yeah. I mm -hmm. mean, again, just some of the really interesting things that, that are that are sort of provocatively suggested by by looking at these patterns. Though it doesn't, there don't seem to be any kind of parallels to the second crisis period that, that you show there, and that's that's interesting in itself. Yeah, well, we don't. The crisis is still unfolding, so we don't know what we'll what we'll see in ten years' time. It's okay. There's someone else. Um, thank you. Yes, also very interesting talk. Um, I have a question, and it might be in the you don't know yet category, but I'm I'm curious that you're just. Your depiction of crime is about the lower lower strata often committing crimes against the the, the next group above. I don't think um, gender-based um, violent crime uh, moves in that direction. Um, I think it's more commonly probably horizontal and at every strata or level or class or mm -hmm. however. So I'm kind of curious. Um, and again, you might not know yet, but I, I'll be kind of curious if 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 there is a a change in forms of resistance happening here, whether you'd end up seeing that on gender-based crime or whether that would roughly stay the same. And right now, maybe your data doesn't break that out, but it would be one, but I mean, I guess my first, mm. my first observation is I don't think gender-based crime fits in the way that you describe, but two, it would be curious to see if any patterns there either change or remain constant. Uh, well, even property crime is not entirely against, you know, higher strata in society. Right. Uh, uh, so, again, w we have done absolutely no work on the subject. Uh, this is, in, in a true sense, uh, a statement of logical possibilities rather than some sort of uh, highlights of, of research that is already in the work. We haven't done any research on it, and uh, I'm sure that there are many people here who might be interested in exploring it. So. One purpose of that presentation is to uh, invite people to, to work on this subject. No, I don't know the answer to that question. Good afternoon, Professor. Uh, I think you did an amazing job at pointing out these kinds of correlations, which you always seem to do. Just two points I would want to raise is first on the issue of the systemicness of this ch change in, uh, in the types of, in the, in, the, in the correlation that we were seeing historically during the Great Depression and then now. One is, is that it perhaps isn't that systemic because it just reverted back to apparently the normal right after the first, uh, right, right after the first crisis, which gives, basically tells us that it, you know, it might do the exact same thing after, after GDP starts rising and, and uh, average uh, income starts rising as well, eventually now. That's the first point, is that it's not necessarily systemic because it doesn't change anything in the long run. Number two is that in your conclusion, you basically said the reason for this during these periods of, of uh, systemic crises, the reason why uh, there's this change in, in relationship is because at an individual level, I, as the average person who would commit crime, say, well, I'm not going to commit crime to the people above me or in people you know, anymore, essentially. It's because these people are like me at the end of the day. They're part of the 99%. But that answers the question as to why crime is not, like that, that, that's an issue of the incidence of crime. It's not answering your own question or, or the point you brought up is the, the severity or the intensity of crime. So the real question is, why is the state during these periods not increasing the intensity of, or, or, or at least maintaining the in intensity of crime to make up for uh, make up for uh, people, you know, having mm -hmm. less or more crime. Yet the question, should, the focus should be on whether this, why mm -hmm. is the state acting the way it is, mm -hmm. not on the indiv individual person. Okay. Uh, but two things about the systemic crisis. The concept of systemic crisis uh, originates not from what happens to crime and punishment. That concept has to do with the uh, sustainability of 
capitalism more generally. It has to do with the objective asymptotes or boundaries on further redistribution and further sabotage, which we dealt with in prior years. So we are just using this concept of systemic crisis. Now, to a little bit uh, flesh out this argument, you know, the 1930s was a period in which many people thought that capitalism was about to collapse. And in some respects, it collapsed. It collapsed uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Nazi and fascist uh, countries in a way that, that a potentially a new regime was emerging to, to change it. Uh, there was uh, a collapse in many countries that moved towards possibilities of socialism and communism. And it also eventually uh, was dramatically altered in the capitalist countries, A, by the war, because the war essentially is what pulled capitalism out of this crisis. And it subsequently uh, resulted in a massive transformation towards the welfare warfare state. So it's hard to argue that this was not a systemic event. The fact that it did not lead to the termination of capitalism is a historical fact, but it was certainly uh, possible, I think, uh, and, and it's not hard to contemplate that something else could have emerged. And I think that the situation now may seem to be not as severe for many different reasons, but uh, one of those reasons is that there is no alternative ideology. So we don't have fascism and we don't have communism as, as significant alternatives to capitalism. So people say, all right, well, capitalism is facing what? And, and it faces maybe some sort of a religious threat from, from, say, from Islam, for example, or it faces the risk of uh, complexity. It's simply too complex to, to handle itself. But these are not uh, sort of ideological alternatives. They are, uh, or at least not the same kind of alternatives that existed in the 1930s that make the systemic nature uh, much more uh, apparent, I would say. But in my opinion, it is n it, the current crisis is not less systemic. We are just not at the end of that crisis yet. Uh, look, if you look at, at the first figure, you, you will see what I mean. See, we're still uh, experiencing massive income inequality. And the question is, if you are to push it further, it means more sabotage, more power. Is this sustainable? So I, I don't think uh, capitalism has resolved the problems yet. And if there will, will be a really systemic crisis, uh, I don't wish it to anybody here. But, uh, but that might be quite similar to what uh, we have in terms of uh, trauma that existed after the 1930s. So that's about the first question. The second question, well, I started this presentation by speaking about the Supreme Court in the United States, uh, saying to the state of California, you have to release uh, one quarter of your prisoners. Uh, there are different indications, and again, this is documented in many of the publications we wrote over the past uh, several years, that the ruling class is really very unsure about what to do. And we do see a decline in the uh, penal population as opposed to an increase. We do see a decline okay we do see a decline in the uh, intensity of punishment in fact it's negative. So what you do see is that the ruling class, and again that assuming that the numbers actually are accurate and that the, the, this presentation is actually valid, but you do see the reverberations of the system, a realization that you cannot basically fill the prisons to twice their capacity, that this is unsustainable, that you cannot go on. So I think you do see an unexplained reduction in crime despite the soaring unemployment. You see an unexplained drop in the intensity of crime, uh, punishment, in fact, to a level lower than it uh, was ever since the 1960s. So, so both, uh, if, you, if you like, the rule of capital and the resistance to it uh, are anomalous relative to unemployment. But maybe there are other things hiding here. You know, I don't know. Other questions? Perhaps we can return then to. Yeah, I don't know if it's going to get any better. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> No, it's, it's, uh, I'm not really all that interested in what is to be done. Um, 
<laughs> actually, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually more interested in the political logic okay. of how, of, of using this analysis. All right. Because to me, it seems, it seems really interesting because it's, it's like okay. sort of a unique in to looking at power. That, that would probably be the best I can All do All right. That. So l let me try to answer uh, to the best of my ability here. And, and that will require broadening the vista here. What we have been trying to do over the past 30 years is to say that we need a different way of understanding capitalism. And the traditional way of understanding capitalism is thinking of capital as something to do with production and consumption. And we have theories of, uh, of accumulation that are liberal. Uh, these theories measure capital and utils in measures of, uh, and units of utility. And then we have Marxist theories uh, that understand, again, capital in terms of production and consumption and measure it in terms of labor time, so from the productive side. All of these theories are lumped in economics. And they deal with power in a very unsatisfactory way, in our opinion. They either treat, treat power as, as a distortion. So liberalism says, well, power is a bad thing. It intervenes with accumulation. We need a free market. We need a society in which there's almost no politics. We need politics that is just going to take care of public goods and all sorts of criminals. Okay? That's what we need, the kind of night watchman government that will take care of making sure that there are no deviations from the rules of the game, and that's it. The Marxists have a completely different view. They argue accumulation is impossible without some sort of a superstructure, and I know that Marx said superstructure only once, etc. Uh, well, we need some sort of a political system that is going to universalize the process of accumulation, give it the aura of a generality, you know, a general principle. So therefore, capital cannot exist without politics. State and capital or economics and politics are interrelated, but they are distinct. If you think uh, about Marxist analysis of capital, it's an economic analysis. It has to do with production and consumption. What we are arguing is no. Capital is a symbolic entity. It's essentially a measure of something else. It measures not utility. It measures not labor time or production. It measures power. It's the way that the ruling class measures its power in capitalism. So our project for the next, for the, for the next I hope, for the next 30 years, but for the past 30 years, was trying to characterize that power. And we are advancing quite slowly, or have been advancing quite slowly, now a little bit faster because I can see here many of my students, PhD students and MA students sitting here and doing work on the subject, some of them, and trying to figure out the manifestation of that power. What gets capitalized? What is being capitalized? So what kind of power is being capitalized? So in this case, for example, the power of the penal system is being capitalized. What you actually, the fact that the stock market can go up, that the income distribution can become uh, increasingly unequal and so on, capitalizes the ability to subject the underlying population to the double threat of, in this case, unemployment, which creates crime, and then comes the other sledgehammer and puts them in jail. Okay, so this is a process that eventually manifests itself records itself in the ticker that you see in the stock market. The question is, how is it articulated? Because from the word go of history, from ancient Sumer, we know human beings take qualities and turn them into quantities. They take bodily harm. They take sabotage. If you cut somebody's arm or you, you know, pop up uh, his or her eye, you have to pay. So why do you pay that amount for an eye and that amount for, for, uh, for a hand? This is a speculative quantification of different qualities. Capitalism does exactly that. It takes different forms of power and it packages them into quantities because quantities are the things that organize society. Every power society is organized to some form of quanti quantification and capitalism is just the most effective in doing so. And the purpose of this project is to flesh out that quantification and it's partly a uh, uh, science but it's also partly an art to invent these processes. You know, I didn't know that until we worked it out over the past uh, year or so. So the 
purpose here is to unveil the power underpinnings of capital. Now, if, if I'm able to persuade uh, a million people that capital is power, that's the end of capitalism. If people think capital is about machines, then the only thing we need to do is to replace the owners of capital with some other owners, say, some sort of democratic control. Uh, that's what the Soviets tried to do, and we know what happened there. Okay, so the idea is if you think of capital as being machines, as being production and so on, it will always come back to haunt you because the logic of capital is about power and it hides in a Trojan horse that is called production. So our purpose here is to unveil that power nature of capital. And in that sense, it's a deep political project whose purpose is to say, this is a power system. If you want to change it, you have to go towards a system that is not based on power. So it is not about what kind of material technologies that you use, but what kind of power those material technologies mediate. Okay, so does that answer yes, the question? Does. Okay. We still have time for some more questions. Hi, my name is Majda. I'm doing my master's here. My question is in regards to um, the privatization of prisons. Um, if we look at it as something that is uh, privatized, not regulated by the state or funded by the state, does that change anything in relation of power and capital, the way you explain it? Uh, it might change something, but the, the point is that the police is still public, still. Uh, the courts are still public. So essentially, the, the catching of, of criminals, the sentencing of criminals is still done by the state. It's just that they subcontract. It's like saying, you know, will people be more healthy or less healthy if the health system is privately organized as opposed to publicly organized? Obviously, it will make a difference. What kind of a difference, I don't know. But in this case, I'm, I'm not sure how big the impact will be on this kind of very general rough type of analysis. It may have an impact in the sense that the uh, private prison systems system uh, somehow is able to increase incarceration for the purpose of making profit out of putting people in jail. Uh, the state will have to pay the bill because, I mean, it's these prisons are privately run, but they're state financed still. So again, I'm not sure what the conclusions uh, will be in, ter in terms of this type of transition, but I, I cannot see how this will affect dramatically the logic of the argument I'm making here, because the punishment itself is still sanctioned by the state and, and mediated by the state. It's simply carried out in a private rather than in a strictly public way. But even a public state um, penitentiary system is still supplied by private suppliers. So the jails are built by private companies. The food comes from private companies. You know, there, there are many private inputs that come into the system. It's just another layer of privatization. Will it make a difference? Perhaps. Uh, I, I cannot see it immediately in the analysis. Anyone else? Uh, I'll just follow up with a question about the limits on how what percentage of the population can control most of the money. I mean, if you imagine, let's say that uh, 90 or 1% or, or of the population controlled 90% of the wealth, that would, I think, just be an unstable system because they would have no one to sell anything to and they do have to sell something to someone. They would have essentially very little labor force and, and so one way of asking that is how, why is it that the inequalities seem to top out, at least in the two examples you have, uh, for the top 10 percent at about the same level, which I think was six. 45 percent, 50 percent, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's a simple question, the answer to which is extremely complicated. 
Uh, I mean, there's one, one way to answer it is a sort of a dynamic question. Uh, Post-Keynesian and neo-Marxists have done a lot of work on effective demand, for example. So uh, as you, and, and Marx himself, uh, if, if you concentrate logically all the income at the upper echelon of society, who are you going to sell to? And there were many debates in Marxism uh, that as long as you can, some arguments was, uh, was made that as long as you can persuade capitalists to continue and invest, then they will generate the demand that they uh, subsequently satisfy. So if you go on building machines, you can go on forever if you can persuade capitalists. And, uh, and of course, there are counter arguments that something like that is, is entirely unsustainable and so on. I, I'm thinking about it from the perspective of power in addition to those technical questions to which I uh, cannot answer at this point because this is, a, as I said, a complicated thing to answer. But from a power perspective, I think that, that to distribute income, you have to inflict sabotage. It's not only that you have it. How do you get it? In order to get it for the ruling class, it has to actually inflict damage, sabotage on society. And at some point, the sabotage either destroys society in the sense that it paralyzes resistance and it conditions people to accept their subjugation, and that's the end of it. So you can have, you can think of the Asiatic model that Marx is speaking about. That in, in which there is no resistance whatsoever it's to speak of, because you cannot contemplate resistance. Or the, you know, the case of ancient Egypt, that the, you, you cannot even contemplate resisting the, the pharaoh. The, it's uncontemplatable. But in capitalism, there is a certain amount of damage that if you can inflict it, you will either create a massive resistance and explosion, or you will transform capitalism to something else. Because capitalism without resistance is not capitalism anymore. The drive is to accumulate more power. If your power is absolute, there is nothing more to accumulate. So the definition of capitalism is the, in, in this sense, in this narrow sense, is the attempt to increasing, increase your power and quantify it. But that assumes resistance all the time. Why is it 45%? Who knows? I don't know. And I don't know if this is an absolute limit. It was a limit in the 1930s. Perhaps it's a limit now. Perhaps in the future, it will not be a limit. And perhaps in other countries, the limit uh, is different. So uh, I don't know here that there are actually uh, sort of historical laws of motion that determine exactly what kind of a limit there exists. I don't know that that is even uh, sort of a meaningful thing to say. Historically, we are, what we have done in our work on the asymptotes of power, and, and if you look at the bibliography, you can see papers that we have written on the subject, is to show, to break down the distribution of income to categories and showing that, for example, taxation, corporate taxation, has been reduced from uh, around 50% after the, the war, Second World War, to about 20% now. Well, you can reduce it to 10%. But the added gain to profitability is going to be limit. And you have to go through a, a very turbulent political process to persuade the population that you can reduce corporate taxes even more. Uh, you can uh, destroy the um, um, entrepreneurial strata in society, you know, unincorporated businesses. And that has been going on for a century. That uh, group of people has been kind of smashed to pulp in the United States. There's a limit beyond which you cannot do it anymore. I mean, you just basically destroy that population. So the arguments that we are trying to make here is to identify what are the societal limits? How much can you push? To say that we can objectively determine those limits a priori? No, we can't. We do that historically. So we look and say, well, this seems to be reverberating. And this, it has, this process has seemingly a long way to go still. What we can say is that when you just begin those processes of power, oppression, sabotage, in the beginning it's easy. But as the pressure becomes stronger, to increase it further becomes more difficult. Because if you are to increase power by 100%, when your power is small, it's very easy. But if your power is very large, to increase it by another 100% becomes technically impossible and certainly socially impossible. So that is the nature of the inquiry, but it, there are no hard and fast rules here to say 45% is obviously sort of uh, the asymptotes. No. Any other questions? All right. This might be 
a good time then to, to wrap it up and thank Professor Nitsan for his presentation. Thank you.